And there we are, grabando, grabando, recording, recording, fancast, grabando, recording. Today we have a special episode, a very special episode. Uh, I think it's the first time there's a international guest on the show. Hmm. And I have a co-host today as well. You might know him from previous episodes. His name is Carlos Fonsi, a.k.a. Casca as well. Uh, today on the show, it is Rodney Greenblatt. Famous. A lot of people know him because of his work for Para Para Rapper. But he also does his own characters from other, I guess I would call them universes. He's mm -hmm. also a musician mm -hmm. and an illustrator in other forms. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rodney Greenblatt, how you doing, good sir? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I don't think I've been on a show for a Puerto Rican audience, so I'm happy to do that. That's really interesting and different. Cool. Um, did you want me to talk about my background a little bit? Uh, sure. I just gave a little bit of information regarding your work, but if you could maybe give a little something more formal or a little bit more about you, that would be great. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I live in upstate New York uh, in a small town called Catskill. I've lived here for five years. I used to live in New York City all the years that I worked on the Parappa games. I would go back and forth from New York City to Tokyo working on that project. And I had a lot of other projects in Japan too. I had another character group called Thunder Bunny. We made a lot of toys and uh, it was mostly toys and printed stuff. So I used to go back and forth a lot And uh, we also had a cafe also in, uh, in Tokyo for a while. Uh, but over the past maybe six years, I've been back here. I haven't been to Japan. I've been doing my own projects and I do my fine art works and I show in a gallery uh, here in Hudson, New York. It's uh, a town right across the river from here where there's a lot of art activity. And um, yeah, it's great. And for fun, I make music. Uh, And uh, it's just really my own crazy weird music. And uh, you could listen to it on Bandcamp <laughs> if you want to hear it. Um, but I'd like making it. So that's, that's pretty much what I do. If you want to know anything else, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. Pretty cool, pretty cool. So I first knew you through the video game, but my friend Casca, he was the one who, uh, basically showed me the ropes, like introduced me to everything else in your world. Mm -hmm. So I'll just let him ask away because he was the one who presented the idea and got me introduced to your entire universe of characters and whatnot. <laughs> Great. The Ron universe. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, uh, first I wanted to ask, like what, like, what got you started into like being involved in art and like in the art world and all? Uh. Well, I, I, I've always been an artist since I was a child. Um, I don't know how my parents figured it out because lots of kids make drawings, um, but I just was into it and they um, just kept uh, encouraging me. And even in third grade, I was like doing art projects uh, for the teacher. <laughs> and then when I was in, ten when I was in uh, sixth grade, I actually made like, um, a bulletin for the school, you know, like some kind of school bulletin and I actually got paid. <laughs> I think they paid me $10, but that was like the beginning of my career really. I mean, since then I just kept going. Um, I, in high school, I, I did jobs, graphic design jobs. And then eventually I went to art school in New York City. And I was really lucky uh, to be at New York City at the beginning of the 80s, right? And uh, a lot was happening. And uh, when I graduated from school, there was a huge art scene happening in the East Village, which was a really cool neighborhood where I lived <laughs> just by chance. And uh, I just got into a gallery right after I got out of uh, art school. And that was pretty amazing. Super dope, super dope. Uh, before doing the interview, I For every interview, I do a little bit of research, not as much to get fully informed regarding the artist, but by looking at your work, uh, you connected how in your childhood, you were always an artist and even you know to this day. So 
by looking at your work, one could tell that children would easily love your work. Mm. I mean, the characters, one could easily see them in children's books and what have you. Mm. So I wanted to know, like, how does your character design come about? And aside from it being colorful, I, when I see it, it reminds me of psychedelia. So I wanted to mm. ask if psychedelia mm. plays a role in your overall influences or inspiration when you do some of your work. Interesting. Um, do you guys know the uh, cartoon, kind of an animation from the 1970s called Gumby? Maybe yes. from the 60s. Gumby. Yes, um, that's my jam. <laughs> when, I watch, when, I, when I watched that when I was a kid, it really went into my brain. I, I re-looked at the episodes actually just recently or maybe a couple years ago I rewatched it because now you can watch it on YouTube and, and stuff. And there's just so many things that are exactly like my artwork. I was so inspired by that. And of course I loved all the other cartoons from that era, from the uh, mid early seventies. So I, I just incorporated that into my brain. And then when I actually got into art school, I started pulling that out and um, people really responded to it. I mean, in art school, there's a lot of experimenting and I imitated other artists. But when I started really thinking about the things I loved, uh, it was TV animation and uh, children's books. And I just started making my artwork using those forms, which felt really natural to me. Um, but they were kind of unusual for the art world. <laughs> it, looked, it looked a little like pop art uh, from the 1960s, but it was actually the beginning of the 80s when I was making my my works, my first works in New York. Um, but people loved it and I loved doing it. So it really took off quite quickly. Yeah, it, it, it felt like ahead of its time too. It felt like something like one would mostly associate like during the 90s, early 2000s, like that, that sort of colorful, more like popping out at the abstract look. But like hearing that, like I, I yeah, I didn't, I didn't know, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think also um, I was very lucky to be in the East Village in the 80s. There were lots of new galleries, brand new galleries looking for all new artists. Everybody was pretty young and I was only in my 20s. So I, I had a chance to have several shows of my work and, and get reviewed and it was just a great way to start. Uh, it, it's rare, I think, now to to come out of art school and have that opportunity. Um, but like I said, my work was interesting to people, so it just really took off quickly. And that that's how I pretty much got started um, with my... And from there, you know, I really built my style more intentionally um, and built things that fit more intentionally into uh, artworks for galleries. And I wrote some children's books too, actually, a little later on. Super dope, super dope. Uh, now that, as Kafka mentioned, like it filled 90s slash early 2000s itch. Uh, I needed to ask, how did the Para Para Rapper collaboration come about? And how was that experience overall? Mm. Well, that was just really amazing. I. I was showing my work, uh, like I said, in the East Village in art galleries. And um, a young man from Japan came in and he loved my works. And he told me he was starting a company to represent uh, European and American artists in Tokyo. So I said, that sounded good. He was, gonna, uh, he was gonna do that for advertising. That was his main goal to, to round up happening European and American artists for, uh, commercial work in Tokyo. I, I wasn't, I never thought of myself as an illustrator, um, but that sounded amazing. <laughs> I just wanted to do that. So I loved him, I thought he was great. He was really fun and his English was great. And uh, so I just started working with him doing some illustration designs um, for Japanese clients. And once again, it just took off so rapidly. Um, one of my first big jobs was actually for Sony uh, before I before the game thing, I had worked for Sony doing illustration for Handycam for their little for those little video cameras, 
that was a big deal uh, in the mid '90s. Those things, and it was a big, it was a big advertising campaign. I'd never done anything like that, but a lot of people uh, noticed it. So it put me on a path of getting better clients. And um, so I was really just doing a lot of commercial work in Japan. Then I got a contract with Sony, different branch to design um, characters uh, for printed products. And in the middle of the nineties, um, there was a big boom in cute characters in Japan. It was, it was a craze. All the, all the school kids had little character mascots on their backpacks. It was, it was very hot. So they hired me to design those little characters. So I did. Um, for about a year, I just worked with this company called Sony Creative Products. They were like a licensing company. And they made tons of cute character designs. <laughs> they were really fun. They were crazy pro products that they sold in stores. And that's how I met Matsura, Masaya Matsura. He was a pop star uh, working in Sony Music at the time. And he was starting to design a game for PlayStation which actually hadn't come out yet. And uh, he also liked my work um, and, had, and had seen it. And since I was working in, with Sony, but in a different building with a different group, Sony is huge, it's like a huge company. Uh, he came over to where I was working with this design group and he showed me what he wanted to do. And I was amazed, I thought it was gonna be great. And I'd never heard of PlayStation. I mean, it was, it was kind of just about to come out. So, um, Parappa was not in the very first uh, set of games, but it was in probably the second uh, family of games that came out for PlayStation 1. Um, so that's how, I, that's how I did it. And I, my friends at Sony Creative Product help, Products helped me um, to connect with Sony Computer, which was a new company also at the time. So I was very lucky. I was really in the right place. Um, I was in Japan a lot. And it was easy for them to um, contact me. And when I met Matsura, he's an amazing, he's a rock star. I mean, there's, there's no other way to put it. You see him and he's very interesting and uh, fashionable, amazing talent. So of course I said yes. And that's how I got onto the Parappa team. Casca, take it away. Any questions related to Parappa? Oh well, yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna ask for what was like given given the the success of Parappa, the first game. Like, there's also the the other one, the other title that also has a pretty good following. Uh, what led to like the conception of uh, um, Jammer Lamy? Yeah, it's a it's a it was um, much more difficult. We had a hit. So Sony was expecting another hit, but we never designed Parappa to be a hit. We, we just thought it was fun, like hilariously fun. We loved the characters and the music, uh, but then the pressure was really on uh, to do it again. But Matsura is, a, is an artist. He doesn't follow, <laughs> like I was thinking sequel. I was really thinking sequel and I was thinking, well, what other teachers could Parappa meet, you know? How far can we, let's have a whole new group of teachers and more rap. But Matsuro wanted to do something completely different. Uh, and he wanted to design new characters, new main character, which was a real challenge for me. Um, and that's how Um Jammer Lamy came. The team was basically the same, but it was bigger and we had a bigger budget. And we were also designing it for PlayStation 2, which really added to the complexity uh, to do it. And it really took us a long time to do that game, almost two years um, to get Um Jam or Lamy off the ground. Uh, it came out great. I mean, I think it is psychedelic. I forgot to mention that, but yeah. I, th that is a psychedelic game. <laughs> There's no other way of, of putting it. The writing is really out there and the storyline is totally insane. And uh, we all loved it. Um, it was just such hard work uh, for all of us. And the, the pressure was so much different um, from our first game. I feel execution wise, it definitely paid off. Uh, at least personally to me, I see it. I, I, I definitely see all the more surreal visuals and all, all the like more strange scenarios presented. And like the characters are a lot more like, I wouldn't say like eccentric, 
were a lot more odd and yeah d- definitely there's a, like there's a, the appeal in it is very different to like what I've seen from the first Parappa game and even here I, I know a couple of people that definitely have like uh they they have like an affection to the, for the game and and like it's aesthetic and everything yeah yeah Lammy Lammy has a lot of followers I mean she has a very tight fan base I, I get messages from them a lot um and I was really I'm, I'm surprised and I'm glad I mean it's already 20 years now uh, since it came out. So, um, yeah, I love the whole Lammy thing. And I, I, at the time we were exhausted, <laughs> you know, from working on it. Um, uh, but it did come out, it did come out really well. And, uh, question, what led to it being, uh, pushed back instead to, of the PlayStation to instead becoming like a PS1 title? I don't, I don't really know. I never knew why they didn't make that decision about PS1. They did Parappa. And I thought Parappa looked great uh, on, on that uh, platform. And I was hoping for Lammy, but you know, there's a lot of things I don't know about what happened at Sony. Um, I'm always getting questions about it, but I really wasn't part of the management uh, of Sony. I wish I had been, <laughs> but I, I was, you know, I was in the art art department in a certain way. So um, I didn't never understood what their logic was. And Matsura has a lot to do with it too. I mean, I had to go along with what he wanted to do and I never really got a complete vision of what he wanted to do. So I just sort of took it as it came. Um, that's kind of what happened. We did Parappa too, which was also Matsura's invention and the same original writer. Um, And that came out nicely, but I think we had lost a little bit of momentum. I think Lammy had worn us out. And then we we had had to design that for another platform and it was another task altogether, but it has some fun characters too. Yeah. I also think, I I do think the music is definitely a step up and the the character designs also a lot more, a lot more, uh, a lot more variety to it. Like even, yeah. even like your cameo also like stands out and gives like a lot more variety. <laughs> well, I was, by that time I was really professional. I mean, when I started on Parappa One, I was just drawing the characters on paper and basically faxing them over there. And they were just rough and they just came out in a rough way. And we all thought it looked great. But later on the tools were better and everything was online and they'd get my drawings right away and I would make my adjustments. And I did them with software that they could use, you know, my, my Adobe Illustrator artworks became, went into the graphics program. So it was just really different um, working on uh, Parappa 2 with the technology. Lamy 1 was a bit of a transition, but by the time we were working on, on, on Parappa 2, it was very smooth. It's a very smooth looking game also when you compare them. It, the animation is much smoother and the worlds are more described and it, it looks good. Yeah, definitely. It looks more, I would say it kind of looks more plasticky, but it's more because of like the more advanced textures of, of that sort of hardware. Yeah, yeah. I think that was good. Although I like Parappa 1. <laughs> I like the really crazy flatness of it, the low resolution. It's really funny to see how small it was like in resolution, you know, like. Like we're talking at Zoom and like, here's the Zoom picture, you know? If you shrunk down those pixels, that, that Parappa is like 640 by 480 or something like that. It's like this on your screen, like a little square like that. And that was the whole resolution. And it was really kind of fun. And uh, I like the looks of it. Yeah, and I, and I, I really like that, that whole like, I think that was like 32 bit. It was 32 bit, 64 bit that period. I get that. I love that appeal from like that digitized graphic. Uh, art like it's 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 made like a somewhat of a small boom in the last couple of years with like lots of um like artists and developers like making a lot of work inspired by those visuals yeah like like pixel art all kinds of pixel art uh, out there in the world which is funny for me because when i was doing pixel art i was kind of like dissatisfied (laughs) like i wanted it to look better it was so chunky uh, but now people like that effect. So um, I could give classes on how to make pixel art. Actually, it's not so easy now. You have to have the right tools. But in those days, that's all there was. 
everything was uh, 256 colors and uh, it was quite a challenge. I, I personally would love to take some sort of lessons on that. <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to think of it. I'd have to practice a little bit. Uh, Photoshop is like everything now. I'm not, um, I'm not using the, the, some of the art graphics programs I used to use. So I'll have to work on that. For sure, for sure. Uh, did that experience with Paraba uh, garner your attention to get into music? Or... Uh, not really. I've always been interested in music. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't feel like I had a, like born in talent to play music, but I've always been interested in it. And uh, the technology, I just loved. As soon as I realized you could hook up a keyboard to a computer uh, in the '80s, I, I was doing that. So I've been experimenting with computers and um, and music all along. Uh, I, I was in a couple of bands in art school and uh, after, even after art school, I was in another band where I played the keyboards. Um, but the rock and roll business is hard, <laughs> very hard. And I didn't really have the guts, I think, to um, get in the van and drive, you know, to different towns and do these shows. It was, it was I think I was, I preferred the art thing and I was making a little bit of money with art. So I decided against the rock and roll business, but I had a big interest in it and, uh, and had been making music all along. And I, I did get to do one song, the very first song that you hear in Parappa, um, uh, the, the uh, Jet Baby song I that, wrote. The song from the cutscene, right? From the first cutscene? Yeah, in the very first cutscene. That was, that's my, that was my musical addition to, this, to the show, to the get, uh, game. Super cool. So as I listened to a little bit of your music uh, Same. last week and this week, and one can see the psychedelic influences, but I love that you shift from very minimalist electronic music to sometimes, again, experimental to psychedelic. Mm. But one thing that describes at least your music, each album, is the cover art. I think the entire, uh, I don't know, 13, 14, what have you, amount of songs, mm -hmm. they're all perfectly encapsulated in the album art. So <laughs> weirdly, yeah. I don't know how you do it, but I think <laughs> it really works. So could you maybe not, I mean, of course, for every album is different, but could you take us through like the experience of making one of your albums and how does the cover art perfectly match to describe the sound that you're working with? Well, it's, uh, I have to think about that, but I guess because, you know, I have done a lot of illustration work um, and usually there's a client and, and the client describes the project and you have to do something. But when it's your own project, it's kind of different. And it's kind of like making an illustration again, except you're your own client. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think about the albums the way they, they, they come out because they're, they're, there's not really a plan until I have a few tracks and then I start to see something coming out. Um, like in the, there's one called Nuthatch. I recorded it all at, out in the country in, in upstate New York uh, at this little, we had a little house up in, the, up in the woods, not in the woods, but out in the country road um, and I was thinking about all the nature sounds and the little animals and things that were around the house. It was always raining. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it just came out that way. So I, I always imagine the little bird. Um, the other things I just, I just, you know, I get to know the songs from mixing them over and over again and getting them right. And I start to get a feel for it. So I suppose it's, I suppose it's like doing an illustration job uh, for someone listening to an album and kind of getting the feel uh, of the album, uh, but in my case, I'm doing it for my own albums, which is really sort of fun. Gotcha. Does the is it difficult for you to take off the artist hat for a moment and put on the musician hat when you're doing the music, or are the muses different? How does it work out for you? Well, I I think um, the music is working on music is very relaxing. I think I use it. Um, 
I usually work in the evening on music and I think it's just, I unwind, I don't have a plan. I let the music just sort of flow out. When I'm working on my artwork, it's more like that's my work during the day. I'm really chugging at it and keeping going and I, I want to sell works. Um, so, and I want to make sure if I have a client that they're getting what they're asking for. But when I'm working on music, I don't really think of it that way. And it, there's something nice about that. Just have the freedom to make it without thinking about um, making money or, or anything. It goes on Bandcamp. I have no idea who will listen to it. Uh, but I, put, I have put some of it on Spotify and all that, but I'm kind of back to Bandcamp. I kind of like that. It's easygoing. Um, so yeah, it's different. I think for music, I'm, I, I relax into it. Um, whereas the art thing, it's my main profession. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so Parapa was the first, was my introduction to you as a kid. But I want to know, as I'm sure Kafka is also interested, but how did Thunder Bunny come about? Uh, Thunder Bunny was a children's book. <clears throat> I wrote in the beginning of the 90s uh, for a US publisher. And um, I had high hopes and they sold a few copies. It wasn't, wasn't nothing, it was all right. But nothing happened to it after that. And they didn't ask me to write a sequel, but it started picking up traction in Japan. And uh, Sony, and as I told you, I was working with this design company, Sony Creative Products. And one of the main designers, she loved it. She loved Thunder Bunny. So she decided she wanted to um, make Thunder Bunny toys. And then I said, we should make a sequel book. And they hooked me up with um, uh, Puffy, Puffy Amiyumi, yeah. pop group, Japanese pop group, uh, to, do the, to do the translation into Japanese. So it was a really cool project. I wrote it in English. And then um, Ami from Ami Yumi, uh, she did the translation. And um, the sequel was a big hit in Japan. It was great. Uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, Sony, I think, a division of Sony published it, I think. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So that um, was helping me move the character goods. And we made lots of Thunder Bunny character goods uh, in that period. Yeah, because I, I was curious because I, I've seen like um, some artwork of the character and I, I just loved like the whole, the whole look of like Thunder Bunny and it was also, um, what was the cat, the name of the cat? No, Wonder, Wonder Mew. <laughs> Wonder Mew. Yeah. Uh, and like I did find like, um, I believe it was like an animation piece and it's at Sony. So I was really curious, oh, like thinking like, was this um, like the origin of like the character? But it's interesting to know, like, it started as a, like uh, an American published book before becoming like a, a Japanese published uh, property. Yeah, yeah. You mean the original where I got the original idea for the bunny? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> that was that was actually from my kids. My kids were little. I had little kids back then, and uh, they went to like a state fair or a county fair, and they they brought home a bunny, and. Um, it was a little little baby bunny and it was really cute, but it grew enormous. <laughs> and that's what gave me the idea. It was actually a brown one. It wasn't a white one, but it just it just was bigger than a cat. Like after a few months, it was just enormous. So I thought I was thinking about a bunny that grew and grew. That's how I came up with the story. But I was really surprised when Sony decided to pick it up. I was I wasn't sure. I, I kind of not had forgotten about it, but it wasn't on the top of my list because Parappa was was happening at the same time. Uh, but they did a great job with Thunder Bunny, and um, they were great people at Sony helping me design the pro. They they actually would choose the products, and I would um, I would approve and look at the designs and, and change things that needed to be changed, but. It was very collaborative and they were great people. So Thunder Bunny was a lot of fun. Super cool, super cool. Uh, right now, Zoom told me that we have seven, almost eight minutes left, but okay. we can restart. But before restarting, I wanted to ask, uh, how does the, how was your experience watching people make toys out of your character? Mm. 
um, it was it was great. I mean, I'm I make sculptures, so I had a good sense of 3D design, uh, but I didn't realize how complicated it is to work with different factories in China, and you know they have a whole process of checking to make sure the sketches and the the character's face is exactly right. They, it's a lot of work and they had a big bunch of people to, well not big, maybe a team of about 10 people working on um, all the character licensing and the character toys. Um, eventually, uh, Parappa got picked up by a big toy company. Um, I think it was Tomy or one of the big ones. And they made a bunch of toys. Uh, just straight ahead mass market toys, not like collectibles or, most of the stuff we made was for teenagers and um, school kids, um, but not like toys. Um, but later on they made a bunch of toys. Those are pretty rare because they, they didn't continue them. Um, after the Parappa animation came out, they, uh, it wasn't enough of a hit to propel um, tons of toys. <laughs> so they only really made one or one season of, of toys, actual kids toys that would be in a big like Toys R Us type of a store at that time. But it was really fun. I mean, I loved seeing them uh, come out and, uh, and seeing them in 3D, the characters in 3D were just, it was just magic actually to see it. Uh, but it is a lot of work and I have to thank all those people who um, did all those products and worked with factories and reps and plush, you know, <laughs> plush animals have different kinds of fur. And like they had to choose all that and, and grade them. They would show me the different possibilities. It was amazing, really amazing. Um, from the stuff I've seen on the internet, I'm, I myself been trying to get myself a plush. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, from from the stuff I've seen, I I think they've done a great job, like translating the the artwork. Like it's it's meant to be seen as like flat, and it translates very well to these three dimensional like plushies and toys. Yeah, yeah, no, they did a great job. It was very very professional. Um, I mean, that's all they did in that group. They they did Sesame Street, and um, what else did they have? They had this penguin called Pingu. and um, they just had some Disney. They did like vintage Disney characters. So yeah, they were just, that was what they did all day at this, at Sony Creative Products. Super cool, super cool. Um, I'm going to stop this meeting right now. Okay. Uh, it's going to take a little while for it to restart because Zoom automatically starts downloading the video. But uh, in any case, you can just log in and I'll accept you when okay. I'll restart. Okay. Okay. I'll, to the same link? Yeah, same link. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. See you in a minute. Yeah. And we're back. Session number two. Again, Mr. Rodney Green. But uh, we were talking about um, Thunder Bunny, some of the experience with some of your experience regarding how you get to see, how you get to see your characters become toys. I can imagine that it was the same with Parappa, uh, you seen the video game, people enjoying it and people enjoying the toys. I imagine that was kind of surreal, no? Uh, I mean, at least for me, if I were to design, if I were to see my toy, my characters being enjoyed by countless people around the world, it would be surreal to some extent. So how was that for you? Yeah, it was surprising. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know what, um, having a hit product means. I mean, I've always been an artist, you know, showing in galleries and even doing illustration. It's a job, you get paid and it's over. Um, but I had no idea what it would be like to have a hit and Parappa just, it just went wild when it first came out and everyone in Japan was talking about it and came to the US and everyone loved it. It was, it was really surprising and kind of humbling because, wow, so many people um, were enjoying it. Uh, I was really, really surprised and really grateful to everyone who had worked on it. I think we were all surprised. <laughs> I don't know why, because it's a great game. But I think because the game world was so full of, it was, you know, Mario and Nintendo and 
and all these fighting games, lots of fighting, <laughs> lots and lots of fighting, yeah, yeah. Uh, sports and um, basketball and all the kind of games, the first generation of games, we just didn't fit in anywhere. And we had no idea if anyone would understand it or, or like, like it, but everyone loved it. So we were just, just as surprised as anyone else. And um, I was already working with Sony Creative. So I'd already seen some of my things as printed keychains and different things like that, but it was nothing compared to Parappa. I mean, there's just so many people recognize the character and it was just everywhere in, the, in those first few years. So yeah. It was surreal and, and really surprising and great for me. I loved it. it. It was great to see like this sort of thing come out and this this era you don't see that much often where like the, these very experimental, I wouldn't say like mascot or character theme, but like had these this sort of like different from the norm approach that kind of distinguished the console generation around that time, especially what made like Sony like become this this mega giant in the game industry during that time. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was always seen as like the the weird underdog that at the same time was like the the the, the big dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well like their thing was uh, Final Fantasy. Remember that? That was their thing. They were like on that and pushing that and it's this totally different um this whole way of thinking than Parappa. And it was really popular. I mean, Final Fantasy was a huge multi-sequel worlds, multi-world thing. Um, so yeah, it, it just, Parappa really just was an art project in so many ways, just a music and art collaboration. Um, it really turned into a whole gaming uh, way of doing games because there were some, there were a lot of music games after that. I think Parappa inspired um, a lot of those dance games and Guitar Hero and a lot of that stuff. I think maybe was surprised was was inspired uh, by Parappa's music approach. For sure, for sure, especially those Guitar Heroes that got such a big boom in the yeah. PS2 era. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So many kids got inspired to pick up a guitar throughout that time. <laughs> uh, I wonder how many play the guitar now <laughs> of those of those yeah. kids. Because yeah. yeah, that was big. That was pretty I, big. I know the big famous one who was inspired by those games to pick up a guitar and is still a big musician is Post Malone, but I don't know anybody else who <laughs> who continues to play the guitar or anything. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, as we've mentioned uh Parappa is at least for for Kafka and I's generation, it was like the big one. Mm. But then you mentioned uh, Thunder Bunny, uh, your music as well. But how about uh, Sugoka? Is that how it's pronounced? Oh yeah, Sugoka. Yeah. How was uh, how did that come about? Uh, that's that was a straight ahead uh, illustration uh, work uh, with. Um, uh, the um, railroad company in north in southern Japan, the the Kyushu uh, Railroad, and their um, uh, payment card system. Like when you go on the train, you, you put this little card on the on the reader. I'm not sure if they still have that system, but um, they they decided they wanted a mascot, and they hired my agent and I, and a huge advertising agency. Uh, to create all these characters and um, and stuff for Sugoka, which was the name of that card campaign. Um, and that was, you know, it was a job, uh, but they were all great people too. I, I, I didn't have many headaches from Sugoka. They were, they were all right to work with. Uh, very, cons the train company was very conservative. It was hard to get them to take any chances. But the advertising agency was very cool. They they could they had all kinds of great ideas. They would take them to the client, and then whatever happened happened. I don't know. I just followed the instructions of what I was supposed to do. But that was great. I mean, all over southern Japan, my little frog character was everywhere, on signs and billboards and 
in the subway. Every single subway person, just millions of people had this little card with a little frog character on it. It was really, it was exciting to see it on the machines. You know, in Japan, they have these elaborate machines you put the card into and you buy the cards and you buy all this stuff. And they had, they had the pink machines with the frog on it. It was just amazing to see. I was really, I was fortunate to do that one. Okay, because like huh? Japan's also really big in frogs, so it's like this. this <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was their idea to do the frog character. So yeah, yeah, they're into cute frogs. But you know, I did an even bigger campaign for the uh, a convenience store called Family Mart, yeah. and that was very Japan only. That was much bigger than Sugoka, actually. Um, Family Mart had at that time, I think. 5,000 stores, 5,000 stores. It's incredible to even think about. In Japan. In Japan, just in Japan. And uh, I designed all these characters for these food products, like fast food, like 7-Eleven. Do you guys have 7-Eleven there? Or this kind of, I'm sure you have convenience stores. We, we had them at some point. I don't know if we still do. Uh -huh. Well, those kind of convenience stores, um, they have tons of them in Japan. It's a, there was a lot of competition, lots of stores. So I designed these really funny characters for uh, food products. Like there was spicy rice and um, smoothie. And uh, there was a pizza that, that was terrible. They put in microwave pizza. <laughs> and uh, what else was there? Lots of things. Um, a bagel, a kind of a breakfast bagel. And I just did all these characters uh, for that. And that was everywhere also. I mean, that was really a big one and they did 10 tv commercials um i bet you can find them on youtube some of them uh for you bet i'm gonna find <laughs> but they were the animation the animation was hilarious and the advertising agency was just on it and they just they just did a great job and that client was much more adventurous and um it was just amazing then, then it just stopped. I mean, like they had these campaigns. They hire it. They hire an advertising agency, come up with the whole thing, and then it ran for about two two years, maybe. I'm like, I think maybe, and then it was over. And then they changed to a different advertising agency and a whole other thing. But I had a great run doing a Family Mart, and the commercials. I mean, ten TV commercials on all the time. A lot of people when I go to Japan know me from that. Mm -hmm. They knew my work more from uh, Family Mart uh, than from PlayStation. Because if you think about it, you had to buy a PlayStation. You pretty much had to have kids. Yeah. Uh, but Family Mart is just everyone. Everyone goes to this convenience store. So it was huge. I mean, it was just huge. I was probably more people um, involved in that job um, than the others. Because it was all over Japan, too. So that one was amazing. Super cool. So uh, I wanted to know, uh, being from the United States, how was it for you seeing that? Sure, my work here has been praised, but seeing it such a big impact on Japanese culture and people appreciating it, I bet that must have been another exciting but surreal experience as well. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was exciting and surreal. I didn't really know much about Japan, but as soon as I got there, they just, my work just connected with the market at the time. Like I said, there was a, there was a cute character um, fad going on and I've been drawing cute characters. So it just, that was automatic. Um, and then I just, I just, I liked it over there. I liked the way they did things. And I met a lot of nice people. I had a great, I have it still have the same agent today. And he has, he's a really nice guy and very likable. And he really went around and helped my work get to where it went. That's a big part of my, my career in Japan is from um, Mr. Tak Iwayoshi, who was my, still my agent. And he did so much to get me some of those jobs. Um, but after after a while, I started getting used to Japan and understanding the culture. I used to stay later. At first, I stayed in hotels, but later when I would go there, I would stay with um, 
Iwayoshi san's family. And I really felt connected uh, to what was going on there. And I think my fans really appreciated that. I even tried to learn Japanese, but I wasn't able to. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. It's really, really hard unless your mind is good with languages, which mine is not. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I tried to memorize things, but I can't memorize anything. So that was a bit of a disaster. But they were all glad that I tried. You know, I wanted to um, speak Japanese, but I, I couldn't. And they were glad that I was doing my artwork because <laughs> I would have to be studying Japanese all day long, every day to like try to get a handle on it. But most of my Japanese fans were glad I tried. But I, I loved it. I loved Tokyo and I got to travel all over the place um, for the other projects. So it's, it's still, I haven't been there in five years, so I'm, I'm hoping to go again someday. Of course, of course. As soon as the, I'm sure that as soon as the pandemic is over or at least close to over, yeah, get the opportunity yeah. to go back. Yeah, I hope it, keep, I hope it like keeps going down. So far I've seen a lot of, <laughs> Yeah. Good coming out. Yeah. Well, they've been having some trouble in Tokyo. They've been having some outbreaks. Yeah. Oh, really? So I, it's not as bad as it has been here, but um, they're still they're still battling it. Uh, the the vaccine isn't out as much, um, or I think the Japanese government hasn't done as well as it could, yeah. uh, getting the vaccine out there. Um, they're going to have the Olympics out there. I have no idea how they're going to do that. That's yeah. I'm going to stay away from Tokyo. <laughs> so that is yeah, they, they've, they've been very persistent about that. <laughs> I know. They should have given up and maybe postponed another year. It's, it's ridiculous. But they're going through with it. But I'm glad I'm missing all that. Crazy American tourists uh, are just not fun. And Tokyo is crowded to start with. So we'll see. Maybe next year we'll yeah. go over there. See for my sure. friends there. For sure, for sure. Uh, I wanted to ask something, but it just went away. So, Kafka, <laughs> if you have any other questions right now. Fine. Um, I wanted to ask, because you did mention about the the Parappa show you did. This was like a, a Japanese like anime production. Yeah. And like I, I gotta ask, uh, would you ever be interested in in wanting to like work on a new animated project be it like using your already established characters be a new property be like ha have you ever been like still had that interest um I did but I think I've given up a little bit um it's a lot of work and I'm kind of enjoying my life being semi-retired at this point I'm I'm still making a lot of things but doing an animation project is a huge collaboration Lots of people involved, writing teams, and um, I don't know if I'm really up for that. I think maybe if the right project came along with someone who really uh, was someone whose vision I really trusted and someone who had the money to really make it happen, I might say yes, but I'm not really pursuing that. Okay. Because mm. yeah, yeah, personally, like, I, uh, as looking at your work, I feel like something like the if it's like based on, on already like established work from yours, I, I feel like something like the Dazzleoids could definitely like translate pretty good to something like that. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. But like I said, if somebody comes along and, and, and has the infrastructure uh, to do it, I would, I would probably be right on it. The writing is huge. The writing is a huge part of it. Um, and that has to be, you know, really great uh, to make it work. Um, the animation that they did uh, was pretty good. Very Japanese style, typical children's anime. Um, but I didn't get to I didn't get to be on the writing team, so I I just had to settle for what they what they did. And uh, I thought it was all right, but it wasn't successful enough. So I I don't know because I don't know what the script was in Japanese exactly or what was funny about it. Uh, but it didn't go as far as they wanted it to go. Um, I think it would have been nice if they'd kept some of the original creators on the animation <laughs> team, but they decided not to, which is fine because they had their own way of doing animation. So I had to let go a little bit uh, on that project. 
but I was just happy. I mean, I've always wanted to have a TV animation. I mean, as a kid, that was just the golden, that's the gold at the end of the rainbow, I think for cute character designs. And uh, they did a great job. I was happy I, and I didn't have to do anything. So I designed a few extra characters, uh, side characters for the game. I mean, for the TV show, but pretty much they did it on their own. I, I just remember the question that I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned how the cute character boom from the 90s was part of what caught the attention for your work so much. Do you think? Because sometimes when I see your work, especially uh, Sugoka, it reminds me a bit of some of the characters from Sanrio, the Hello Kitty characters. Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. that, do you think that's somewhat indirectly inspired some of your later work or that work at the time? Or was it just, I happened to do cute characters and the world just clicked and everything came together? Um, well, I, I, I think um, I was already designing fun characters, but like I said, I worked for a company, Sony Creative Products, that was wanted to compete with Sanrio. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were competitors, so they were they were guiding me a bit. I mean, they would they would check my drawings, and they would they would choose which ones they thought were were cute enough. I mean, there were levels of cuteness <laughs> that, they, that they understood. Uh, and uh, I just had to, I just had to learn and go with them. Uh, but fortunately, I really liked them. I liked my, my team leader that they had there, the, the manager and the other designers were great. So in a way, it wasn't that we were inspired by Hello Kitty, we were fighting Hello Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Hello Kitty won. <laughs> Basically, it's hard to beat Hello Kitty. It just is a huge, uh, huge company and a huge beat of Kitty. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I was so glad to be in the competition. Wow! I mean, I'd see my stuff would be right in the store with all the tons of Hello Kitty merchandise. So that was great. That was great. For sure, for sure. There needs to be some sort of crossover at some point. <laughs> we'd love to see that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw that recently you released uh, To Just Be yeah yeah Marvel. yeah. so I can imagine it is somewhat inspired by this whole pandemic experience but how did how did they how did it come about well um, it has 24 tracks <laughs> it's I've never done that many Uh, that much different, that many different songs. And, and it's definitely the pandemic period. I mean, there was no place to go and there was nobody to see, just be home. My wife and I are just here together. And um, in the evenings, I just was making tracks. I just made so many tracks and um, no idea where they were going, but it was just such an, in a way, a nice time to work. Uh, I think I would have rather been out um, going to the, we have some nice clubs here in Catskill, but uh, there's just was none of that. So I just really hunkered down. I did a lot of um, tracks and then there was even time to do the mixes. I just, I just kept going. I mean, I realized I had so many tracks. I was, first I was thinking it was going to be two albums, but then I realized, um, no, let's just, let's just make them shorter, the song shorter and uh, just put them all out there. Um, all my different moods from the, the period. And like you said, there's a mix of really experimental, almost noisy tracks, and then more pop sounding, like, like rhythm oriented, we could say tracks. So I, I just decided to keep it all. And that's kind of where the whole title came from, just, just being myself. I don't have to answer to a record company or any fans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to worry about fans, just band camp and, and my few followers and um, people who discover it um, is great. Um, and I think I tried to make the best of that time. And so that's kind of my, um, my legacy of that year, um, making all those tracks on that, on that record. 
Super cool, super cool. Uh, you mentioned the be uh, a little bit of like just being yourself uh, without worrying much for what others would say. So I wanted to ask in this new era of social media, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any form of advice for uh, people who just want to be artists and want to <laughs> just share their work on social media? Wow. It's, I, I think social media is really hard. It's, it's work in itself. And like, you gotta, I guess, I mean, I, I'm from another decade. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've been at this for a long time and there were other ways of getting your work out there then, but now I think you're dependent on, on social media as an outlet. And I think publishers now and, and even galleries are looking for people who have followers. Um, so you, yeah, it, you can't ignore it. You gotta, you gotta make it work for yourself and it just takes hours and you have to plan that into your whole art career. I think you got to plan your Instagram and you have a strategy and, and have a great website and really get it out there. I mean, I think it's just so hard right now because there's so much to look at. I mean, you can see artists work in every part of the world in 10 minutes. Uh, so it's, it is a challenge. And uh, I don't even understand Twitter. I just got a Twitter account a few months ago and I just, I don't know what is going on there. You have to be on that to make it's, that work to answer those, everything, everyone commenting and, oh, it's, it's, it's beyond, it's beyond, <laughs> it's beyond my ability at this point uh, to deal with Twitter, but um, I try to keep my posts and things going. I'm pretty bad at it. Uh, but for Thanks. artists now, I think you, you just, you have to do it. I don't know another way of getting your work out there. Sure, for sure. Casca, I wish you were I had more happy advice than that, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's our reality of our world. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's what it is. Casca, you were going to ask a what? Oh, um, I, I was curious about like um, one of your one of your works. Uh, there was this. You, you've had a history of working on like comics and graphic novels, like with the Rodney Fawn comics. Um, there was this one that I found out about uh, this year called Dharma Delight. Yeah. Very very different from all your other work that I've seen. I yeah. I was curious about it, but I I wanted to ask like what was the the origin of it? What was in its conception? Oh yeah. Well, I've been, um, I have another side of my, my, of what I do. I, I study Zen Buddhism and I've been studying it for about 14 years now. I, I started in the village Zendo, which is a, a Zen temple in New York City. Um, and I do a lot of meditation and I was working at the temple, doing a lot of stuff for them, helping them. And I made a lot of artwork. Uh, when they discovered that I could make quickly do artwork, uh, they asked me to do some posters for their events. And um, I started making uh, Buddhist, Zen Buddhist inspired artworks for the Village Zendo's events, right? So they would have speakers and um, Buddhist teachers come to New York City. Uh, So I would draw, I would draw these cool like Buddhist looking images. And after a few years, I had a lot of them that I designed for posters and postcards for the Zendo. Um, and uh, then I decided I would do a book. I've been studying and I had done many retreats. So I, I really had um, the Zen Dharma in my mind. I still do and I care about it. So I, I decided to make a book My teacher said it was okay, and I gave them this thing, the script, and they said it works, it makes sense. I wasn't sure. Uh, so that was from 2016. So that was my last, uh, my most recent published book. Uh, so it's all my work that I did for the Village Zendo, and then other things I added um, to fill out the whole book. And it's actually, it's, a, it's kind of a graphic novel. I kind of designed it for teenagers who want to, um, who maybe want to get into meditation, uh, but it has real information in it and actually shows you how to do Zen meditation um, exactly the way we learn it. 
uh, in the Zendo. So that's how Dharma Delight came about. I'm very proud of it. I think it's undiscovered. I mean, it's, it was a small publishing company, um, but it's one of my favorite pieces. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, I was I was curious about checking it out because like I, I also got a friend who's like very interested in that and in, in, in Buddhism and like I, I showed it to them and they were like oh this is pretty interesting so I definitely definitely will check it out. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, it's got a lot of fun stuff and also different kinds of artwork, paintings and drawings and illustration, um, all kinds of different mediums and things I did. Um, but yeah, it's great. I love I love Dharma Delight. I'm glad it's out there in the world. It's still being published. Um, I sell them on my website, and uh, they sell them in bookstores in the U.S. I'm not sure about other places, but uh, it's still around. Super cool, super cool. Uh, I just got a new question that popped into mind. I wish it was earlier, but hey, got it now. So you mentioned how indirectly one of your uh one of your kids inspired the creation of thunder bunny with the bunny that he brought home so i wanted to ask if any of your kids uh inherited the artistic gene <laughs> yeah they did they're twin girls they're 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 in their 30s and yeah, they're both artists, but they didn't want to be artists. <laughs> they still don't want to be artists because they lived in the world of being a freelance artist. And although I've had huge success, it was just always craziness and always wondering if we would make enough money and a lot of late nights working and also traveling, right? I'd be gone for a long time when I went to Japan. so. I think they both weren't interested in following that. Uh, they wanted to do their own things. So they, they've they gone in different directions, but they have tons of talent to make drawings. Um, and they do once in a while. So they did inherit, my, my wife is also an artist. So there's a lot of art um, genetics in our family uh, that continues. I mean, they're great. They're both great. Cleo can paint beautifully and uh, Kimberly is an amazing uh, illustrator. But neither of them do that professionally. So who knows what will happen later on. It's great to have like such a such a creative unit. Like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it it is great. My wife is a really, really good artist too, a, a fine art maker. And she also made many other things, clothing and she designed children's clothing and all kinds of stuff over the years. So yeah, we've always been um just doing our stuff and being freelance artists um, since we met in high school, in, in art school. Super cool. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. To be honest. <laughs> uh, I earlier I mentioned the the new album that you put out in Bandcamp. Uh, yeah. Do you have any other projects that we could be looking out for, uh, be it in 2021 or in the future? Yeah, I'm, well, I don't know how this is going to go, but I'm, I'm, I've been con con contacted by a new gallery in Tokyo that I've never worked with before. Uh, I, I've known of this gallery, um, and this, the person who runs this gallery, uh, um, it's called Show Gallery. I think it's called, it has a strange name, Show Plus One, or something like that. Um, it's a new gallery. Uh, in Tokyo, in a very interesting part of Tokyo, not down in the not down in the big shopping district, but up near the university, it's a different area. And um, I just started making some works to send there. So I've been making some new works, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna put them up online so everyone can see them. But it's 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 totally new, uh, new works. Uh, small too that it's very interesting they want me to make works that are kind of in the in the 20 inch mm. they want me to make sculptures and things that are in that kind of this 20 inch size uh which is really interesting uh i hadn't i've never had a gallery tell me they wanted it to be that specific <laughs> they're always interested in the ideas and the um you know how exciting and how sellable it is but this guy's interested because he wants to ship them 
it's very practical. <laughs> I'm really kind of excited about that. Uh, so that's going to happen very soon. I'm just finishing. Um, I was just working on them today, some small sculptures uh, that are going to go um, on a trip to Japan and hopefully be sold in a gallery. I haven't done that in a while. I've, I've shown my art here in Hudson in, in upstate New York, but um, Tokyo is a big art world, a big art market. So I'm really curious as to how that will go. So that's kind of what I'm working on now, um, getting ready to um, put some stuff. If it goes well, I'll probably have a show uh, in Japan again of my fine artwork, uh, which would be really exciting. I'd get to go back hopefully. So that's actually what I'm, what I'm gearing up, what I am working on right now. That's great. Uh, again, Zoom told me that we have seven minutes. That's seven minutes left. So I'm gonna close this session now and restart again, so we could finish up the the interview. Okay, sure. Cool, cool. Right. And there we are, third session with Mr. Rodney Greenblatt. Uh, Kaska, do you have any questions? I don't have any right now, but what do you have? What do you but right, right now I'm in the same <laughs> I'm the same as you. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask that. that's okay, that's okay. Uh, Ronnie, when when it comes to your gallery work, uh, of course when you work with somebody, say like Sony or somebody who's hired you, uh, is a very collaborative effort. But when it comes to your more personal or gallery work, how does the creative process change between one and the other? That's a really good question. Uh, I think you, as an artist, the gallery is important. The, the kind of work and the, the place where the gallery is, the space in the gallery, um, it really becomes part of what you're doing. It's, it's easy to think that in the gallery situation, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's all about your own heartfelt ideas. Uh, but it's also, um, you're, you're connected to it. You're connected to the gallery and you're connected to the other artists in the gallery. And it's a different experience. It's very different than having a client type of a, a relationship where you know exactly, they tell you what they want. Uh, working in an art gallery is very interesting. I, I've changed my mind about it over the years. I, I used to think it was a place where you just let your ideas, whatever they were, come out. But now I see it as um, like a venue, like, you know, like the kind of place where you want your art to be. And uh, I think art galleries are still really viable and, um, inspiring actually uh, you know when you're at home and you're making if you're making your paintings or making drawings you don't know really where they're going to go and it's easy not to think very much about them you know they end up in a drawer you show them to your friends you post them on instagram but having them in an art gallery is, is kind of special uh, and it makes you really see your art uh, i think in a different way than posting it on Instagram, which is funny because a million people could see it on Instagram and like not that many people go to art galleries. But there is something magical about having your stuff uh, in an art gallery and I, I've really come to appreciate them and I, I wish there were more there were more and it was easier to uh, for people to go to art galleries because it's just it's a different experience to see the actual works uh, than to look at them online. And I've really, I've really decided to appreciate that um, because it's really hard to get into an art gallery and it's really hard to have a show and it's really hard to sell. And it's just, it's a challenge, uh, but it is, it is really great, uh, a great system and a great way to, great way to build your art uh, and build what you're saying and understand yourself. I think the art, art gallery is great for that. Do you feel like it allows for like a more, like a more personal experience for like if there were to get to have like this sort of environment that feels more in tune with your your style, your approach, your like what what you say like what what's like kind of true to like you 
what what's being like demonstrated in your work you feel like that's what like distinguishes that from just having like hey here's my here's my page this is my work yeah yeah it is different in that way i think um okay so imagine you're 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 a musician and you're going to play uh music uh, for your friends in the living room or in the backyard let's say you're going to do a concert for your friends in the backyard that's one thing but what if they asked you to play uh in a, in a hall where there were going to be 3,000 people, it would be a little different. You would, you would, you would, your mind would, would uh, take that information in and uh, you would step up, you know, from playing a concert in your backyard um, for your friends uh, to a room with 3,000 people in it. You would automatically... Uh, and anyone who's in a rock band, I think would know what I'm talking about. It's a different, it's a just, a, it's slightly, it's subtly different. The, the songs could be the same, but you're gonna, you're gonna think about it in a different way and you're gonna grow. I think that's what happens. And I don't really know about Instagram and these things, if they have that, unless you have 30,000 followers, I don't even know how that happens. People make that into a career, but maybe the same thing happens. Um, but for me, uh, uh, since I'm, I'm very old school, let's face it, <laughs> the art gallery gives me that inspiration um, to make, to bump up my work a little bit more uh, than just putting it out there for my friends. Um, so in that way, it really is different. And I, I think inspiring. Not too much. Uh, since we're on the topic of gallery, um, I don't know how familiar you are with this new NFT situation, but do you know, what can you tell us about your perspective regarding this new way of looking at exclusive uh, visual projects via the internet with these NFTs, which are now turning into, I guess, a new space for digital artists to just put up their work? I have no idea where it's going. I, I really don't. I mean, it's, it's a very weird way. You're not actually selling your artwork. You're selling basically what amounts to, the way I think of it is kind of like a marker, a flag of your artwork that exists in that, in that cyber blockchain world, a flag that is there forever, um, as far as they can tell you. Uh, and it's just a really strange, different way. It doesn't, it doesn't suit my way of thinking, but um, for a lot of digital artists who have been struggling uh, to get their work out there and actually to make money, it's amazing. What some of those digital artists have done uh, with work they've been doing for years, uh, in that business is incredible. I mean, for an artist to sell a digital work um, for six or seven or eight thousand dollars is incredible, and for them to sell for sixty, seventy thousand dollars is just beyond imagination. I mean, to to sell a painting in an art gallery at that price level is is really really difficult. So, I just am really um, amazed and and uh, you know the ingenuity of these artists and those collectors it's another thing it's a whole world of other collectors who understand artwork in a completely different way uh, that is just amazing I, I hope it keeps going on it's you know it's a crazy up and down thing with the values and no one knows where the value is going or how you collect these things or what do you do and the reselling it's all very up in the air in the art world, the, 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 the analog art world has been doing this for years and it's all very well developed. Um, the way galleries work and the way the secondary markets work, it's all very well known and well explored, but boy, the NFT thing is, is out there. I don't know if, if NFT artists are listening to this, I say, go for it. I mean, and also push those tech people to clean up their act a little bit with the, um, 
with the environmental part of it. Yeah. It takes tons of electricity to keep these markers and going in this magic invisible cloud. I mean, it's so hard to imagine yeah. for me anyway. How yeah, that's like the biggest downside of of that, the whole Yeah. But they I think they're gonna figure it out. I mean they're 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 geniuses. They're software geniuses who put this together. They're gonna to figure that out, I think, in no time. I think I would predict within a year they're gonna figure out how to get their um, environmental impact down. But uh, I don't know where it's going. I don't I don't even know what to think about it. It just <laughs> It's just the craziest, most out there thing. And the collectors, some of them have millions. Like it's like play money to them, I think. I don't know. But um, they've been collecting Bitcoin or Ethereum for years. It's like other people are collecting, you know, baseball cards and uh, coins. And these guys are collecting shares in this business that is huge. It's amazing. Definitely one of the most interesting things I've seen throughout the whole pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. And it just like came out of nowhere. I mean, for me, it just came out totally out of nowhere. At first, I didn't even know what I was looking at when I looked at those, those um, websites where they sell them. I really had no idea what it was. Uh, and I've, I've had to explain it to many people because I, I know technology pretty well. I mean, I've been doing computer art since the early 90s. So I, I could explain that aspect of it. But wow, the whole Bitcoin and the Ethereum and all that is beyond my understanding. It's amazing. Sure, for sure. Uh, I wanted to ask Kafka, Kafka, are you working on your own NFT now? I still, I've still been like, I still have my like own reservations of it. Like I'm, I'm still waiting on hearing any like news on like the whole environmental aspect yeah. of it like as soon as soon as something like that is made public it's something that consider but like to this day i still don't have much of a clue of what exactly it is mm -hmm. because because still like uh, it's it's still like I, I i think it's still like a new concept even if it's seen like a huge rise mm -hmm. <laughs> well i i think you have to um one of the problems is you have to buy into the whole uh, uh the whole cryptocurrency. You have to start a cryptocurrency account. You have to use your own money to buy a certain amount of cryptocurrency to get going. And there are fees that, that are along the way. So it's, it's, it's not free, that's for sure. And then it's crazy because when you own some of this stuff, the values go up and down and it can mess with your mind. For sure. <laughs> One day it's worth you know, you put a hundred dollars and then the next day it's worth 200. You're like, wow, the next day it's worth $75. So it's, a, if you're not used to that kind of stuff, it's really kind of crazy. Yeah. And then the prices are just, uh, it's hard to figure them out. But yeah, I think you should definitely thing. try. I think, I, I, I think once they get the environmental thing figured out, which they will, because I think it's a real stumbling block for them. Uh, I think it's worth, for younger artists, it's definitely worth doing. Um, you know, for a couple hundred dollars, you can put the thing up there. Uh, but okay, I do know one thing, another thing I know about it is you really still have to promote your work because there's a million artists making NFTs. So you have to, you got to have your Twitter together and all like I was talking about before, you still got to do all that stuff. Yeah. But boy, <laughs> if you hook, hook into those collectors, it's, it's really amazing. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Rodney, earlier you mentioned how when Parappa came out, uh, PlayStation was heavy into Final Fantasy and its sequels. So if the opportunity were to come where they were like, Rodney, would you do some illustration for an RPG rhythm-based game that involved <laughs> Parappa in some way? Would you be interested in doing that? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> that would be really crazy. You mean like the huge production, like like those, um, I don't know, those battle, those those war games or something like uh, Fortnite or what are those, like that kind of stuff? That would be incredible with my characters. That would be hilarious. But That'd, that'd, uh, be, <laughs> that'd be so wild just like Parappa with like a, like a colorful gun and stuff. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. yeah well, there's a there was a battle game. Did you ever see that thing called Battle Royale? Yeah. yeah. The, yep. They wait, asked. You mean the PlayStation All Stars one? Yeah, PlayStation All Stars. Yes. yes. And they asked. They 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 convinced me to put Parappa in there because they were all Sony different characters from different games. Mm-hmm. And they they really I wasn't too sure because I didn't want Parappa to be in a, bat, in a violent battle game, but it's kind of a kids kind of battle game. But I didn't allow Parappa to have a gun. I, I just thought that's just too much. So Parappa whacks people with a skateboard. <laughs> and actually, this whacking people with a skateboard is really harsh. <laughs> He's swinging a skateboard, whacking somebody with it was actually more violent than I thought. But <laughs> it's still kind of funny. So I went along with it. I don't think that game was a big hit, but... Um, it, it was weird. I, I There was like a lot of hype for it and, and then it came out and like fizzled out. But I, I feel like that whole concept, just, just seeing these characters together, it it, it, it like I, I, I feel like it, it should have been a hit. I, I, I've seen some time ago, like someone go into detail over like the development and stuff that had to do with like information being lo- leaked ahead um, and stuff like that that affected like sales and such. But like yeah, the, the, that whole thing looked like it could have been like a very big hit. Yeah, I think though, I think it was kind of a copy of a Nintendo game with Nintendo characters battling it out. And Nintendo's better at that kind of marketing and better than Sony at stuff for kids, basically. Mm. So I think they were a little behind. And their characters, I don't know how it all, I don't know, the Nintendo characters all have a certain look and they all go together really well. Yeah. Even though for the different planets and different worlds, but it was crazy in Sony with the different kinds of characters they have. And the characters weren't as popular. I mean, Sony's characters besides Parappa aren't as well known, I don't think, as Nintendo, let's say. So um, they were playing a bit of catch up. Uh, yeah, there was there was like a huge like the the difference in like character designs from like different franchises like what was like way too <laughs> way too diverse compared to Nintendo. Like that kind of for me personally, that kind of took me off. Like you see, like the the the, the kill zone characters like fighting yeah. with like uh, was I don't think Crash was there. Like I think Jack and Daxter, and it was it was like. I don't know. It just felt too surreal. It, it felt too too surreal. <laughs> yeah, I felt it was a little forced. Is the way I felt it. Felt it was they're forcing this to happen when a lot of the characters weren't that well known. And like you said, for different audiences, right? I mean, just different audiences mixing up in that. Where Nintendo has a kind of a broad regular audience. So uh, yeah, but, you know, Sony's trying to you know they're trying to get their thing out there. It was all right. For sure, for sure. Uh, as I'm sure you've noticed, we live in an era where nostalgia is a very big thing. So do you think that Paraba might make a comeback in some form? Maybe another sequel? I don't, I, I really don't know. I get asked that question a lot. I mean, it's up to Sony in a lot of ways. I don't know what they'll do. I, I, they, they're in such a, an adult direction that they've gone in. Um, and, and PlayStation is, it's a big production now. And they're, I just don't know where Parappa would fit in in their current world. And also nobody I know is there anymore. I mean, they, they're, they're always hiring younger people. So I don't know. It would really be up to Sony, I think, to really bring Parappa back. Um, Another game company might, but they're all busy with their own franchises. So I, I really don't know what will happen um, with Parappa. I, I do want to say one thing, one dream I had was, you know, Nintendo has Super Mario. And that was really great for them as a mascot, like for their own company. And I always thought it should have been Parappa. Like Parappa should have repped Sony. That would have been great. I think they really missed that. Because Sony's, a, a, Parappa's all about music and um, he's a teenager and uh, he plays he plays games himself. I mean, he would have been, I think, a great match uh, for Sony, for corporate Sony. 
And I designed corporate characters for other companies. So I just was really hoping that someone at Sony would do that, but it never happened. And I think that was a mistake. <laughs> they yeah, should, I, I, I they see it like just... he, he felt he, he felt like right in the middle between like Nintendo's family friendly approach and like by the time uh, Sega's more edgy, more adult leaning and like having probably be this like, hey, it's for, like he's got like these these qualities of them that that appeal to like both demographics. Yeah. Uh, I, I see that. Yeah. 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 So wake it, up, Sony. <laughs> Come on. Still do it out there in Sony business land. I don't know what's wrong with them, but it's hard to get them. It's now it's hard to get their attention. I mean, actually, the battle, the, uh, the battle game, the All Stars battle game, there were some really big Parappa fans in Sony. That was in California, a, a, a gaming design group in California. They were all huge fans. I and actually that's one of the reasons I wanted to do it because they were all played Parappa and knew it well. So I was hoping they might uh, jump on it as a project. But I don't know how their projects get the green light. So I, I just you know was hoping, but it didn't happen. Yeah. So I, I still have some hope, but I do not know. I really don't know. I was curious to um, bringing this up. Uh, have you ever have you heard of this game that's like been pretty popular lately? It's called uh, Friday Night Funkin. I, I've heard it. I have heard that name, but I haven't seen it. Okay, because I like it. I've I've seen people like bring it up a lot, and I've seen some outlets like refer to it as a sort of like spiritual successor to like those Parappa games, and a, a lot of people have, have apparently so it's been getting like also giving the those games the Parappa games like a like a resurgence, yeah, uh, in social media. Mm -hmm. So it uh, like not to sound like I'm like the most optimistic person in the world, but like it's it's great that's gotten people talking about these games again, and like who knows if it, like probably like Sony would rise from that slumber and be like, hey, like people still have that like love for those games. Well, there's still an audience out there. Yeah, I know. I, I, I know there are people who want to make fan games and there's so much fan art. Oh, it's amazing what fans have done over the years and the poses and Parappa comics and animations, and everything that fans have made. Um, I don't know how it compares with other games, but I think it's pretty big, um, Parappa's existing a new fan base because YouTube has made it accessible. If you don't have a PlayStation, people watch it on YouTube. So I, I, I think that could drive some interest from Sony to resurrect this, um, but I don't know. Sure, for sure. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned how they should have probably took far up as the mascot character because seeing yeah. as a, as how time has uh worked along like parable was a, a nice in between a kid friendly slash teen friendly character mm -hmm. the music especially today is such a heavy uh, such a big thing such a big market i mean we yeah. use it basically every day yeah that parapa could have become like mario in the sense of like multi-dimensional with many soundtracks that people could easily digest every day yeah multi-sequel type of game so i totally see your point when it comes to like maybe instead of crash or spiral but up i could have been that character to be the the sony mascot yeah definitely i like your thinking <laughs> please have a meeting with sony about this it, it seemed very obvious to me i mean you know, you know, Nintendo makes a lot of other games and all kinds of stuff, um, but they put the Mario thing on there and you recognize it. Mm -hmm. I think I think Parappa could have played that role. Um, sure. and, I, and I think we could have, like what they do with Mario is he does all these kinds of race games and, and um, board type board games and mini games, all kinds of things they have uh, Mario doing. Parappa could have done those things. Um, for Sony, but it wasn't the direction they wanted to go in. So um, I don't know. I don't know. Let's just keep hoping and keep Parappa alive somehow out there in YouTube land. 
Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, Kaska, you have any other questions? Well, well, for now, I'm good, actually. Super cool, super cool. Uh, Rodney, before we close out, uh, where can people find your work? What's your social media and your website? Uh, my website is whimsyload.com, W-H-I-M-S-Y-L-O-A-D, whimsyload.com. I've had that website for 30 years, I think, oh. maybe even more. And um, you can see all my fine artwork there. And then my music, Bandcamp is the best place. All my albums are on Bandcamp. You can also hear my music on Spotify and Apple Music. Uh, but I didn't put all my albums up there. Bandcamp is is great, and if you buy anything on my any of my music on Bandcamp, I get some money. <laughs> it's not like YouTube. I mean, not yeah, new YouTube, nothing. And uh, and of course, Spotify. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever made any money on it. But um, not that money is so important, but it is nice. Mm. And uh, so Bandcamp to hear my music. Um, I'm on Instagram. It's Musho Rodney. Musho is my my Buddhist name. It's M U S H O. So Musho Rodney is my Instagram feed, and I have a I have a Facebook page too. A lot of people contact me on my Facebook page, and I, I answer questions and stuff. So that's there, and that's about it uh, that I really pay attention to. Perfect, perfect. Well, Rodney, first off. Uh, thank you very much for being open to do the podcast. Yeah, uh, thanks. Despite the whole rescheduling, uh, we managed <laughs> to do it, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We did yeah. the Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. But no um, yeah, I'm really glad you guys had me. It's really been fun talking to you. Indeed, it was. Indeed it was. Yeah. Uh, second, uh, stay healthy and look at, you know, we get out of the pandemic and stuff. You know? Yeah. Keep staying healthy. Yeah. It's um, getting better around here too. So I hope yeah. it's okay down there. Yeah, slow, slowly but surely. Slowly but surely. Um, All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks.